Let's learn the purpose of histograms, how to read them, and roughly how to create them. We're going to focus more on the reading than the creating. A histogram is very similar to a stem plot. They have a very similar purpose, uh, although a histogram is a lot more flexible. So, for example, this is a quantitative distribution, a list of numbers, and this is a stem plot. If you were to make a very similar histogram, it's going to look something uh, like this stem plot turned on its side. So I'll leave our original stem plot here. If you were to turn this thing on its side, and you turn each of these numbers into a bar. So this is a single number in this column. It's going to be a bar of height 1. Single number in this column, another bar of height 1. And that's repeated a third time here. So we have three bars. And you'll notice that all of the bars should be touching one another. Um, Whenever you make a histogram, you don't leave spaces between your bars. This one here has a height of 5, because there's 5 numbers in that column, 3 and 1. So our histogram usually looks something like this here. On the upper axis, we have the frequency. It's a count of how many uh, numbers are in that column. So one number is in this column, 2, 3, 4, five was the most in any single column. And down here are labels. We need to redo our labels because uh, instead of labeling let's say 70 to 74 uh, in this column we would label at these spaces. So in this case here at this first gap we start at the number 70. And we transition if you look here we trans this was the 70 to 74 group and then we do the 70 to 79 group. So we transition here with 75. That's kind of our, our point where we switch which bin the numbers go into. And then we have our 80. And you get the idea. We keep counting upwards uh, by fives. And so if we had the number 96, for example, we in our stem plot would add that here. And our histogram would make the bar height a little bit taller here. So histograms and stem plots can be very similar. The reason why we want to have a histogram instead of a stem plot sometimes is when we have very large lists, for example. And a very large list of numbers making a stem plot would look a little bit ridiculous. So what we do is we take one group at a time. In this case, we're breaking it down into bins or uh, groups of 10 at one time. So the 70 to 80 bin. All numbers that are above 70, but 80 or less, we count them up in this whole big list, and we see that we only have one of them. So 73 is the only one between 70 and 80. We put a frequency of 1. Next group, numbers that are bigger than 80 and 90 or less. The only reason I do the 80.1 is just to clarify that if we have something right on the edge, like an 80, we have to decide which group it's going to go in. So in this case, the number 80 is going to go in the group above. That's something that some histograms will use and some histograms are not as good about using. So numbers in the 80s. We have this 86, 88, keep looking around here, 85 and 85. One, two, three, four numbers in the 80s, including the number 90. So that would be a frequency of four. And you repeat that all the way down. The most important thing when you're doing histograms or when you're reading a histogram is knowing that all bins are the same size. Some of bins have more things inside of it. This first bin only had one thing. There's four numbers here. There's 14 numbers in the 100 to 110 bin. But each bin is exactly a width of 10. So that's the most important thing. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that frequency chart that we created and that gets turned into a graph. So the first bin, the 70 to 80, and you'll see how it's labeled down here, has a height of 1 because there's a frequency of 1. There's only one number between 70 and 80. Next one, there's four numbers between 80 and 90. Bar is a height of 4. And what this does is it allows you to see the basic shape of the distribution. So, for example, in this case, it seems like there's kind of a major peak around a patient stay of about 100 to 110 days. And in this case, we keep our labels down here, number of days. 
over here, our frequency, how many patients, how many numbers in our distribution, uh, which corresponded to different patients, uh, are there in each of these ranges. So there's a lot of patients in this 100 to 110 day stay. But there's also an interesting uh, thing going on over here. Between 150 to 160, we get another spike. If you are only looking at things like the mean and the standard deviation, some of those numerical things, or even potentially a box plot, this type of information is not going to show up. You're not going to necessarily see those two separate spikes. You might, in fact, end up getting a calculated average that's somewhere around here, when really uh, numbers around here are not reflective of any patients. It's most patients are either above or below that number. So sometimes the mean and median can be a little bit deceiving and we make sure that we have a symmetrical graph with a single peak uh, by drawing a graph like a histogram. Otherwise we end up with sometimes bimodal graphs. That means we'd have two peaks. Just one quick note, uh, sometimes you'll see histograms and sometimes you'll see uh, histograms using relative frequency. All that means is on uh, one, we count exactly how many numbers or how many patients there are in each group. So there's two patients, four patients. At the most, there's 14 patients in a single group. With relative frequency, it's just a percentage. So this group here has 23% of the patients. This group here has less than 3% of the patients. So sometimes it can be very useful to know the relative frequency because it makes it easier as a percentage. Other times you want to know exactly how many values in that distribution. In this case, how many patients fall in each category. So they, the, sh the graphs are going to look exactly the same as long as your bins are the same. It's just going to be a different label on your left side.